Good morning, Bethel. We are so glad to see you guys here. Why don't y'all stand as we begin worship this morning?
it in the verses whenever they danced with joy whenever they sang praise and worship him even after they were beaten and put into prison guess what happened there was an earthquake the chains were let loose the doors flung open I want to ask you what is your chain what is holding you back this morning from having that relationship from having that kind of faith because if you were in that position would you do the same thing so as we sing this bridge again, in Matthew 7, 7, it talks about asking, 
you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. So I want you to think about that as we sing this bridge. Here we go. And all we have to do is just ask, seek, knock, watch the door swing wide open. Roll back that stone. Let me hear you. Roll back that stone. And all we have to do is just ask, seek, knock, watch the door swing wide open.
Hug somebody's neck and you can be seated this morning. God is good all the time. How about give a little love for Darren and the crew this morning, filling in and leading, in, leading us in worship. Yeah. So welcome, man. We are so glad you're here. We're excited to be here. It's always fun to come hang out on Sunday morning, worship God, hear from the Word of God. Um, we are in week number two of our series home sweet home, church home. We're talking about the importance of church, the importance of our church home, how, how for you and I, for born-again believers in Christ Jesus, how our church, it should be of much value and much importance to us. We should be better because we are coming to church and gathering with like believers. Can I just tell you right up front, right off the bat, let me tell you, look at me, look, 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 look. There is no perfect church. 
And if you're looking for the perfect church, you are out of luck. They're, they're, if you're looking for the perfect church and you find the perfect church and then you start attending that perfect church, it has all of a sudden become an imperfect church because we are imperfect people worshiping a perfect God and a perfect Savior. You know, it should be important to us as believers I'm gonna read you some scripture, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. I read this scripture last week. I'll probably read it several more times before we're done with this series because I'm a church guy and I love church. And my life is better because I have attended church. Can I hear a good amen? amen. Hebrews 10, 24, we get mixed up in what church is supposed to be. We get mixed up in the purpose of church. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 25, 10, 24, and 25, and let us consider, look at your neighbor right quick and say, hey, neighbor, you need to consider. Let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. I'm gonna tell you straight up in the American church today, here's what we say, what's that church got to offer me? What's that church gonna do for me? Does that preacher preach like I like? Do they sing the type of worship that I like? Do they have this small group for me? Do they have this Sunday school class for me? In the American church, we have made it all about us and what does that church have to offer unto me? But when you read the word of God, the word of God says we should come together as a church and let us consider how do I encourage and stir someone else up to be all God has called them to be. How many believe our churches would be better, our churches would be fuller, and people would be serving God better if we made it about encouraging someone else and stirring someone else up rather than making it all about ourselves? Oh, y'all got quiet on me. Come on, somebody. Let us consider how to stir one another. Can I just tell you, seeing you on Sunday morning, it stirs me up and it encourages me. Can I tell you, John, what you've been through and the faith that you have and the struggle that you've went through, when I see you show up on a consistent basis in the house of God with your row of people that you're bringing leading to church, it encourages me and it stirs me up hard when I see you bring these steer jocks in and when I see your family change, it encourages me. When I see you, it stirs me up to good works and if you and I will just look around the church and see what the Lord has done in the lives of our brothers and sisters, it will encourage us and stir us up to want to serve God with passion and with energy. Church, man, not neglecting meeting together. Yeah, I know it's Sunday. Guess what? Sunday is the Lord's day. Come on, somebody. It ain't your day. It ain't my day. It's the Lord's day. Not neglecting meeting together on Sunday especially as we see the second coming of Christ drawing near. Now, I'm no student of prophecy, so don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying this. As I look at the world that we live in today, I can see prophecy unfolding like this. Can I tell you that America is never mentioned in the word of God and America is never mentioned when it comes to prophecy? When it comes to prophecy and it comes to the prophetic word of the second coming of Jesus Christ, it always has to do with Israel and it always has to do with Jerusalem. And you know what? I'm not the smartest, but as I look at our world right now, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel are under attack right now. And that is one pointing to one thing that we're one day closer to Jesus. Jesus coming back than we've ever been. So why would we not want to come together? Why would we not want to worship with like believers? Why would we not want to come together and encourage one another to continue to serve God? We come to church. We are better together than we are by ourselves. When you come to church, when I come to church, it keeps me on fire for serving the Lord. I'm going to tell you a story. It's an old story about this elderly man that quit coming to church. I mean, you know, some of us, we're looking for an excuse to quit coming to church. Well, it was too loud. 
Well, he didn't speak to me. Well, they didn't do what I, they were just all looking for a reason. You know what I mean? Can I tell you, every, how many of you will be honest and say this? I woke up on a Sunday morning and said to my spouse, think we ought to go to church today? The answer is always absolutely 100% yes, we ought to go to the house of the Lord today. Tell you a story about a man that quit coming to church for whatever reason. He was gone for several weeks, and so the preacher went and made a visit to him. He lived in the country. It was a cold winter night, starting to sleep just a little bit. It was cold. Preacher knocks on the door. The old man opens the door, never says a word, says, come on in. They go in, there's a fireplace, there's a fire going, there's a rocker sitting here, a rocker sitting here, never a word spoken. The old man sets down, the one that had been skipping church, he's rocking in the rocker, the preacher sets down beside him, they're rocking in the church, in the, in the rocking chair. In a minute, the preacher reach up and grabs the tongs and he pulls this log out of the fire. This log is flaming, this log is putting off heat, this log is bright, and the preacher grabs the log and he pulls it out of the fire and he sets it over here on the mantle like that. They just keep rocking. In about five minutes, that flame that once was blur burning bright, all of a sudden, it's beginning to smolder and smoke, and it's lost its flavor. It's lost its light, and the preacher grabs the tongs, picks it up, puts it back in the fire. Boom, starts glowing hot, red hot, flaming once again. The old man looked over to the preacher and said, thanks for the sermon, preacher. I'll see you at church next Sunday morning. Because you and I are better when we come together and it creates a greater fire and a greater movement. I want to read you the scripture today from Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at what the Apostle Paul says when we become a part of a church. When God directs our path. Look at me, look, look, look at me. You, know, you are not here by accident. The steps of good men and women are ordered by the Lord, and you are here because the Lord has ordered you to be here. We are not the best. We are not perfect, but we fit you, and you fit us, and we are here together to bring glory to God and to grow in the kingdom of God. And Paul says when you join up with a church, there's a certain way you ought to act, and there's a certain responsibility that all of us have. We're going to read today, what's our responsibility for this church? Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, Paul says, I, therefore, a, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walk with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager. We should all be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Why? Because there is one body, there is one spirit, just as you are called into one hope, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one, one Father of all who is over all and through all and in us all. We are a part of the body of Christ. We're a part of the body of Christ. And Paul says when you become a part of the body, See, you need to understand that you and I, we once, we were not a part of the body. Once because of our own sin, once because of our own choices, we were separated from God. We were separated from the fellowship of God. But now, because of the blood of Jesus Christ and our faith in him, our repentance, we have been adopted into the family of God. We are a part of the body of Christ. Some of you, you ain't never belonged to anything in your life. Some of you, you've always been an outcast. Some of you, you've always been filled with insecurities and you've been made to feel like you didn't fit in. Can I tell you? This is not everything else. This is the kingdom of God. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, you fit in and you belong and you are special. And God is glad you're here today. We fit into the body of Christ. Now that we've been adopted in the family, we ought to walk like we're children of God. We ought to walk. We ought to live like believers. We ought to walk like we're a new creation. We should walk like we're a child of the king, we should walk in all humility. We should walk, we should conduct ourselves like we're thankful that God adopted us. We should walk full of joy. We should walk as servants. We should walk in this body of Christ saying it's not all about me, but it's all about him. We should walk like Jesus walked. Can I tell you, there is a responsibility in being a part of the body of Christ. There's a responsibility. Walk like Jesus walked in humility. 
In gentleness, that one kind of hurts. Can I hear a good amen? Walk in patience. Walk in love. Can I tell you what you should do a part of the, the body of Christ, the church? We should be eager to maintain the unity of peace. We should be eager to maintain unity. Can I tell you what the enemy wants to do? He wants to bring division to the body of Christ. And I am appalled and I'm taken back at the amount of division that is in the church in the United States of America. Because you get in a church and this, church, this, this group is divided against this group and this group wants something different than this group and this group. And we have all these things divided. That is the tactic of the enemy to come in and to destroy the body of Christ. We should all be eager to maintain unity and to keep peace in the church. How many of you know we need peace in the church? Can I tell you there's a difference in a peacemaker and a peacekeeper? Can I just tell you that right quick? You know what a peacekeeper is? A peacekeeper is someone that just wants to keep the peace. You know, I don't want to make this group happy, and this group wants this group, so I'll just give in to them, and this group wants this group, and this group wants this word, and the next thing you know, you got a big bunch of chaotic division in the church. Leadership in the church, can I tell you something right quick? You want a real church that's growing, that's moving, that's operating in the spirit of God where lives are being changed. You have to have some leadership that will, that, that, that will make peace. Not just keep peace, but make peace. Because if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus made peace. And sometimes before peace can come, there has to be some chaos. And Jesus went in the church one day. And when he went in the church one day, it was messed up and fouled up. And he turned their tables over, scattered their money everywhere ran their sheep out and he made peace in that place sometimes you have to be a peace maker Paul is here and he's in the church and he's saying you gotta fight to keep unity how many of you know when you get five or six hundred people together with different personalities with different ideas with different ages with different backgrounds you gotta work really hard to keep unity and peace Keep everybody focused on glorifying Jesus Christ. The enemy's greatest tactic is division. Mark 3, 25. Mark 3, 25. And if a house is divided against itself, it will not be able to stand. House divided will not be able to stand. Paul says you gotta work hard to keep unity. Always. You gotta work hard to keep peace. You gotta work hard. I, I just Can I just say this right quick? I'm taken back by the pastors that I know and the division that's in their church. Because you got this group of deacons who's against this group of deacons. And this group of deacons who's against this committee over here. And this committee over here is against the worship pastor over here. And this committee over here doesn't like the preacher. And this committee doesn't like that we're doing a food pantry. And this committee doesn't like that we're not doing small groups. And, this, and there's just division everywhere. It's the enemy coming in to destroy the body of Christ, and how many know there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God, there's one Father who is above all and through all, and it should bring unity to the body of Christ. There's one church. I know there's First Baptist. I know there's Northside. I know there's a church of Christ. I know there's the United Methodist down there. I know we're the Assemblies of God, but can I tell you, there's one true church, and it's the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. And I love to make fun of Baptists. Come on, somebody. The frozen chosen, the boringest people there ever was. And I love to make fun of them Church of Christ. Them suckers don't even know what it's like to have any kind of musician or any kind of music. And I love to make fun of the Methodists who want to sprinkle you and not dunk you. And I love to make fun of the Catholics. Glory to God. I love to make fun of people. But at the end of the day, they're all on the same team as me. And there's one church, and it's the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. And just for the record, don't think they ain't making fun of us too, y'all. Just saying. <laughs> there's one church. And here's the deal. There's many different flavors. Many different flavors, many different styles. How many of you remember when Baskin Robbins ice cream was really good? Come on, somebody. It was on Buffalo Gap Road in Abilene. I mean, like, that was the celebratory thing for us when I was a kid, like, to go to town. That's what we used to talk, call it, go to town and eat. And you know what? This is how poor we was. We went to town and ate at Taco Bueno. Come on, somebody. Bueno chilada platter. Can I get a witness? 
And then we got through at the, bueno, at the Taco Bueno. We always went across the road to the Baskin Robbins. And my old granddaddy, he was about that tall, about that skinny, weighed 140 pounds his whole life. And he'd say, give me a three-scoop Jamocha Almond Fudge Hot Fudge Sunday." And he would get his first, and by the time we got the rest of ours ordered, you know, Ricky, he'd order, he'd eat it all, and he'd order him another hot fudge Sunday with your mocha almond fudge and eat it all. That's what we did. Like Carter and me and Carter, we grew up together. And Carter, he, he was a little, he, he liked a banana royale with pralines and cream back when you could still get butterscotch syrup. Come on, somebody. You take David Hager to Baskin Robbins ice cream, 31 flavors, you know what David Hager's going to order? <laughs> Vanilla, because he's David Hager. And he lives on the river out there. Looters, come on, y'all. You take Clara to Baskin Robbins, and she would get some pink bubblegum ice cream. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Little pieces of bubblegum. Jennifer and Jesse, they would get the, the mint chocolate chill. Here's the deal. 31 flavors at Baskin Robbins, but it's all ice cream. Every flavor was ice cream. It had heavy cream, it had milk, it had sugar, and it had eggs. It had all the same ingredients. And here's the deal. It was your choice. No choice was wrong. No choice was better than the others. It's your choice. And can I tell you, the same thing should go with the place, the church that you attend, and the church that you call home sweet home. It's your choice. There's different denominations. There's different flavors. Some churches this morning, they are reading out of the King James Bible, hither, thither, and thou, glory to God. They are reading out of the King James Bible. They have a tie on. They have a suit coat on. They are very dressy, and they are very, very quiet. Then there are other churches that are very unkind. They're very casual. You can come as you are, wear your boots, wear your jeans. We're going to read out of the New Living Translation. There are churches that are very, very quiet. There are churches that are very, very loud. Churches that have no music. Churches that have music. Churches that have steeples. And churches that are gonna have a big skull painted on the side of their church. There are churches that sing out of the hymnal, churches that have program after program after program in children's ministry and youth ministry and women's ministry and men's ministry and marriage ministry and divorce ministry and depressed ministry. There are all kinds of churches out there this morning. And what you and I gotta do is we gotta choose the flavor that we like the very best. And when you choose the flavor, can I preach just a minute to you? And when you choose the flavor that you like best, you know what? Then make up your mind, that is my church, and that's where I'm going to go, and that's where God has called me to be. I'm not going to grout. I'm not going to be complaining. I'm not going to be part of the division. I'm not going to, I'm just going to get over and serve and give everything I got because God called me there, and if I'll do my part, and we'll all work together to encourage one another and stir each other up to good work, God will be glorified in that place. The choice is yours. As long as the main ingredients are the word of God, worship, prayer, and Jesus Christ being lifted up, God's blessings will be upon that place. Pick your flavor. Can I tell you about Bethel right quick? Here's Bethel. Here's what God has called us to do at Bethel. In 2024, we do simple church. Simple church. That's what we do. We're not complicated we're not going to have programs. No, listen to me. No, we do not have children's church. If your children are five and under, they can go to the nursery. But beyond that, we're going to do family church. It's what God has called us to do. You take your kids to the dance. You take your kids to the football game. You take your kids out to eat. Why not bring your kids to church and worship as a unit and worship as a family? That's what God has called us to do. There's no classes. There's no programs. And you know what? God has called us to do church and to do church in a salty way. I love that. I like somebody to get a little salty. Come on, somebody. Got a little flavor and a little spice. Come on, y'all. I don't want to be bland. God has called us to be salty. You put a salt block out. Us livestock people know you put a salt block out for cattle. Put a salt block out for horses. They get deficient. They need a little salt. They go up and they lick the salt block. When they lick the salt block, it gives them the minerals that they need to be healthy. It gives them nourishment. How many of you know salt creates healing? How many of you had a sore in your mouth and your grandmother said, you need to go gargle with some warm salt water? Come on, somebody. 
because it promotes healing. When, it, when a cow or a horse licks salt, it creates thirst. It creates a desire in them to go and to drink some more water and to be healthy. That's what God has called us to do at Bethel. Do church on Sunday morning and be salty about it. It will always be dark. It will always be cold. It will always be louder than your grandmother's church. We're going to do what we do because we believe God is doing something through us that will create a thirst in you. And when you leave this place on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, you are thirsty to go drink of the living water yourself and get healthy. That's what we're going to do. And I would encourage you. Can I say this to you? I would encourage you, embrace our uniqueness. Embrace the uniqueness of Bethel. Embrace that I'm not saying that we're the perfect way. I'm not saying we're the only way. I'm saying this is what God has called us to do. So embrace our uniqueness. Because people say to me all the time, well, are you ever going to have Sunday school over there? No. <laughs> well, are you ever going to have children's ministry and divorce ministry and sing? No, we're not. We're not. If you, can I say this to you, look at me. If you're a part of the body of Christ and you've been washed in the blood of the lamb and you've been filled with the spirit of the living God, if you feel the need to start a women's group, you know what? Then you have organic connections already, people that God has placed in your life. You know what? Cook some hamburger helper and invite your girlfriends over to the house. Open up the Bible and read a couple of scriptures about it and talk about it. Find out what each other's needs are and pray for one another because that is what the church is really all about, empowering people to go and share the good news. You say, Cody, I have kids. I have kids. Well, you know what? Then get together with other folk that have kids the same age as yours and come together and eat a meal and make some homemade ice cream, roast a weenie, make a s'more, and teach your children and other children about the Word of God. Can I tell you what I think is wrong with the church in America? We have set and we've said this. If the church will do that for me, then I will grow. If my church will do that for my kids, then my kids will grow. We have have put the responsibility off on the leadership of the church when that is not a part of the word of God. God has always said, go and make connections and go raise up disciples. Y'all got really quiet just then, didn't you? Organic is the best. Organic is always the best. Make connections. Do what you do. You have the anointing. We are unique. This style of church fits our culture because so many of you come from so many different ways. That's what cracks me up. Can I just say, sorry, Tubby. She's gonna get on to me for saying this. You know what cracks me up? Y'all all drive from a long distance to get here. And if we had Sunday school, none of you Pecker Woods would show up anyway. <laughs> and then we have church on Wednesday night. <laughs> There's 640 people gathered at this church last Sunday morning. We have church on Wednesday night. A hundred of you show up. Sorry, Tubby, I had to say that. Here's the deal. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not saying we got it exactly right. But how many have ever said this? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Did you know? Can I take it? And I don't mean this in a bragging way. I just want you to know. On Easter Sunday a few weeks ago, we have four campuses, Anson, Sweetwater, Albany, and Stanford. Can I tell you, I remember the very first Easter that I was pastor at Bethel Assembly. You know how many people we had? 104. You know how I know that? Because we had like 40 people coming on a regular basis. And I said to them, if you get 50 people to come, I'll crawl up on the roof and I'll sing a solo after church for all of you. And I said, if you get 75, you can put syrup and feathers all over me. And if we get over 100 people to come to church, you can shave my head. 104 people in Billy Lamb shaved my head after church. <laughs> it looked like he'd been killing hogs, man. I was bleeding all over my head. 104 people. Can I tell you how many people went to church at Bethel Assembly this last Easter at Anson, Sweetwater, Albany, and Stafford? Over 2,200 people gathered to worship God at Easter over there. Over 50 people gave their life to Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. 
Can I tell you that we are set to baptize over 40 people in two weeks right here at Bethel Assembly? So you know what? Why would we change what God is blessing? Why would we want to be like another church? Why wouldn't we be unique and keep doing what the Holy Spirit has called us to do? Because God is moving when we're obedient to him. It is what it is. Why would we want to replicate another church? And I say this with all love. I mean this. If you're looking for a church that has all of that stuff, you probably drove by two dozen of them getting here this morning. <laughs> and I'm not saying that they're wrong, but I'm saying church is so important to me that I would rather have you attending a church where you agree and can be eager to bring unity and live in peace and grow. I'd rather you be over there than over here if you don't like what God has called us to do. Because it's powerful. We're gonna do what God has called us to do. We're gonna keep being salty. We're gonna keep wearing boots and jeans, y'all. We're gonna keep wearing caps up here on the stage. Some people lose their crap over there, Brian Parmalee. We get, we get hatred all the time about I can't believe y'all. And they say this, that old fiddle music over there, that's just a bunch of honky-tonk music over there. I can't believe y'all giving them kids beef jerky snuff and candy cigarettes over there. Listen, we gonna keep being salty and we gonna keep preaching the word of God and we gonna keep trusting God to save lives and do what God does. I'll tell you this story because I was made aware between first service and second service. There's an old, there's an old man lived in Hamlin named Ted Miller. Preached the gospel for 60 years. Faithful old man. Old school man. I mean, they did church over in a little bitty rundown building with evaporative coolers. They sang the same songs for the last 45 years. But he gave his life to serving and loving Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'll never forget one time they was giving me crap in the assemblies of God. Said it's just an old cowboy church. It's just a bunch of old honky tonk. They're just hillbillies over there. And old Ted Miller, totally opposite my style. He stood up for me. He said, y'all shut up and you leave that boy alone. He's reaching a culture group of people that we're not reaching and he's just being a missionary to the cowboy in the country world. Shut up and leave him alone and let him do what he's doing as long as he's preaching Jesus Christ. Ted Miller died and passed on yesterday. Thank God that he encouraged me. I met a couple this morning after church from Hamlin, Texas as well. They said, this is our third time to be here. They got a little boy that's about that tall and the music's too loud for that little boy and you know what they do? They put earphones on him during the worship. They sat right there. I met them out front today and they said, you know what? We grew up in the traditional church and it did nothing for us but said, I'm telling you, God called us to this church and everything that you've preached on the last four weeks has been everything that we need to get our life right and we are excited to come to church every Sunday morning. Can I tell you, praise God for that. Car, not Conrad. Who's leading worship today? Darren. <laughs> Darren, y'all get Darren. Look at him. Here he comes. He's back there drinking almond milk and, yeah, eating a tofu burrito right now. <laughs> Thank God for our church. Thank God for the church of Jesus Christ, the blood ball church. Thank God that the people that can't take me and can't take you, thank God that they're worshiping down there at the Baptist church today. And those that don't want to be the frozen chosen, thank God they're at the Methodist church down there today. And those that don't want no music at all, they just want to sing, thank God that they're at the church of Christ today. Thank God for the church. We're better at church. We're better together than we are by ourselves, but I want to challenge you today. Let's embrace our uniqueness here at Bethel. We do what we do. We're going to keep doing what the Lord called us to do. We're going to keep on being salty. Let's embrace it. Let's ask ourselves, what can I do to make this church better, to make my church better? Y'all stand on your feet and we'll close in prayer. Father, we just love you and we thank you for today and we thank you that we get to come here 
thank you for this place. This place ain't perfect. Preacher's rough. He don't always get it right, but thank you for this place that you've called us to where we can come and we can be set on fire. A place where we can come and we can drink of the living water and be salty, Lord, and it, it creates us a thirst outside of here. Thank you for this place. This place has touched our lives. This place has changed our lives. Lord, let us feel the responsibility of how we should walk and how we should act. Let us feel the responsibility of how we need to stop division and be eager for unity in this place. Lord, we love this place, and we love this place because you're here, number one, because you always show up. Speak to us about encouraging one another. Speak to us by stirring others up. Lord, let us be like that fire. Let us be flaming hot. Let everybody that comes in here, Lord, let them catch fire. Thank you for our church, God. Thank you for the blood-bought church, but thank you for this place. Let us be motivated to give our hearts and our lives and our efforts and our energy and our best to this place. Let us surrender, lay it all down to make our church a place where lives are changed. Lord, speak to us as we close in worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
see real quick and we'll run through some announcements it's good stuff <laughs> hey if you're a visitor with us here for the first time today we just want to, first or second time we just want to say welcome to Bethel and welcome to Sunday morning service here with us we're so thankful you're with us we're blessed that you chose to come be a part of our service if you didn't get a card when you came in fill out this or scan this QR code with your smartphone fill that information out we just want to send you a gift love on you a little bit and get to know you and let you know a little bit about Bethel so church come on and put your hands together today for our visitors I know that y'all noticed the tent's gone, it's happening, concrete's coming out next this week. Um, y'all have a bunch of grace and mercy as we go through this transition. Getting in and out of here may be a challenge at times, so just bear with us as we go through that pro process. Um, 17th, this Wednesday, we'll have church, so come be a part of that. It's always fun on Wednesday nights, a little more relaxed and laid back. Come join us for that, it's always a good time. If you took a picture on Easter Sunday and have not picked that up yet, Kelly's at the merch booth. Stop by there and see her and pick that up. If you had a family or friend with you, make them come back and pick it up themselves. And next Sunday, you do not want to miss, actually, you don't want to ever miss Sunday, but you definitely don't want to miss the next two. Next Sunday, a good friend of Cody's who he's met in his long journey is St Stephen McCorder is going to be here. He's a singer, songwriter, and author. He's an unbelievable story. He's been here several times, and he is good, and you do not want to miss it. So come join us next week for him. And then finally, the 28th is Baptism Sunday. I mentioned it just a second ago, but you do not want to miss baptism here at Bethel. It's a blast. It's a lot of fun. Whether you're being baptized or just being a part of the celebration, it is incredible. So come be a part of that. If you want to be baptized, there's a sign-up sheet out in the hallway. Stop by there and sign up so we know that we can get a hold of you and talk to you and visit with you. But do that. Cody's going to be at this door, so that'll leave the room in the hallway open for you to go sign up. So kiddos, come grab you some candy. I mean, you guys have a fantastic week. Tylen, you close us out today, bud? To my knees and pray Come Jesus, come Let today be the day Sometimes I feel Like I'm gonna pray But I'm holding 
to hope that won't fade. Come, Jesus, come. We've been waiting so long for the day you return to heal every hurt and right every wrong. We need. Come for 